Dear ones, would you turn to the, the, the verse we studied two weeks ago, Romans 8 and verse 8. Romans 8 and verse 8. It's page 982, 982, and Romans 8 and verse 8. And it runs like this. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we've been talking for oh, a, a number of weeks now about being in the flesh and being in the spirit. And that all of us here are living either in the flesh or living in the spirit. And it's really not a great mystery, loved ones, so don't back off from it and say, oh, that sounds kind of mystical stuff. It's no great mystery. Say you come into depression. You're waking up in the morning and just that depression is lying on you. Or you get home from work at night and the depression hits you. Then there are two ways to deal with it. Either you can deal with it from the outside by trying to affect your emotions through your body. That way, you'd take a tranquilizer or you'd take a pill of some kind that would give you some kind of uplift. Or you'd take a shot of whiskey or you'd take some kind of drug that would stimulate your body to stimulate your emotions, to try to lift them out of the depression. Now, that's one way of tackling the depression. Or, you could turn to that truth that is expressed in 1 Peter, you remember, cast your anxieties upon the Lord, for he cares for you. And you could stop and just say, but God, the maker of this universe, knows what I'm in the middle of at this moment. And he loves me. And I can't see my way through this stuff. But I know he loves me. And I know he's already working on the job. So, Lord, I can't do anything about it except use up adrenaline. So, I'm giving it to you. But you can tackle depression either one way or the other. Now, tackling it by the alcohol or the drug, or the pill, or whistling a little tune, or turning on the TV, or going out to a movie, that is living in the flesh. You see. That's trying to fill your needs from the outside through the activity of your own body or your own flesh, or from the world or from other people. Now, looking up to your Creator, and remembering that he is faithful, and that he said, cast your anxieties upon me, for I care for you. That's living in the Spirit. See? That's looking up to God to fulfill the need. So, that's the difference. It's not a mystery. Living in the Spirit is looking to God. Living in the flesh is trying to find an answer to it by your own methods. Some way that is independent of God. Your roommate uh, maybe just your roommate uh, at college, or maybe it's your husband or wife, is perpetually late. Perpetually late. They never miss. They always drag their feet when it comes to any appointment. So that's your problem. You can tackle it either by living in the flesh or living in the spirit. Living in the flesh, you do it this way. Remember, John, you're always late. Okay, let's not be late for this one. Okay? Okay. Or, are you coming, John? Are you coming, John? That kind of stuff. Or, more subtly, we think more subtly, okay, I've got your books, and your coat is sitting on the table. We think that's more subtle. But, whatever way we express it, our approach is, let's just lean on them a little. 
you know. <laughs> That's the only way to beat this fellow or beat this girl on this problem. So let's just lean on them a little, just push them a wee bit in the right direction. Just manipulate a little. Really all it does, it frustrates you. It makes them utterly dependent upon you because they depend on that kind of nagging to go on all the time. And of course it brings continual strain into your attitude towards them. And it's almost impossible to be other than critical of them. Now, that's doing it in the flesh. Or you can look up to God and say, Lord, I thank you that you know where we are at this moment. I thank you that you are in charge of this situation. Lord, I put into your hands my reputation if it's lost by us being late. And anyway, Father, it's not going to destroy me for the rest of my life if we miss ten minutes of this thing. So, Father, I trust you with this. And, Lord, I just let your love and peace flow out to my roommate or to my husband or to my wife. And, Holy Spirit, you correct them because when you correct them, you do a thorough, deep job that lasts. And all I'm going to be doing is putting band-aids on them for yet another day. So, Lord, I just rest back and I love them and accept them as they are. And let's just take it as it comes. So, loved ones, you either can live in the spirit or live in the flesh. And it's the same with every situation. In a time of recession like this, you have the same choice. You can either trust God to supply all the food, shelter, and clothing that you need, or you can trust your job. So you can either look at it that it's God who has created the whole economy, it's God who has allowed it to come into this present chaos, and it's God who really supplies all your food and shelter. That you really do believe him when he said, I will supply all your needs from my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Look at the lilies of the field. They don't toil and they don't reap. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, I'm going to look after you the same way. You either trust him and believe that whatever job, however great a job you've had for the, the previous years of your life, it's been God that has been supplying the food and the shelter and clothing. And the only reason you've been doing the job is to obey his commandment in Genesis that you are to earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. You can take that attitude. Or you can live in the flesh about this thing and you can say, oh, well, that's okay, Pastor, but let's face it. It's the old job that brings the money in. I depend on my job for my food, shelter, and clothing. And I believe I deserve this food, shelter, and clothing because of the useful job that I do for society. And loved ones, if you trust your job, when your job goes, you're finished. You worry incessantly about getting another job to supply you with the food, shelter, and clothing. So really, you can either trust your job as a primary source of all your needs. Or you can treat your job as an optional method that God chose to give you what you need. But that he's going to give it to you anyway. So you can either walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh regarding your job in, this, in times like we're in today. And loved ones, that's the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit is vertical. Trusting God for the things deep down in your heart. No bluff, no pretending. You really trust God. Whether it comes through your mother's hand, whether it comes through the unemployment people, whether it <clears throat> comes through your employer, or whether it comes by gifts through the mail, it's a vertical trust. Or you can trust horizontally. In which case you're involved always in trying to manipulate, trying to get the thing going the way you need it to go. It's either trusting the outside or trusting that it comes from the inside. It's either trusting the arm of the flesh, or trusting the life of God's Spirit. But it's trusting one or the other. And that's the difference between living in the Spirit and living in the flesh. Now really, uh, old Paul says, of course, now, you all, you're not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit. 
Isn't that true? You're all in the spirit. You're not in the flesh. And then you say, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. We're with you. That's right. Yeah. We're not in the flesh. We're in the spirit. That's right. And I know half of you are saying, well, wait a minute. If, if those illustrations of yours are right, well, we're in the flesh a bit, I'm afraid. We're not in the spirit, at least not all the time. But loved ones, if you're not living in the spirit, then the spirit of God does not dwell in you. And if the spirit of God does not dwell in you, then you do not belong to Christ. And then we all say, no, 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 I didn't mean that. That's going too far. No, no, I, I, I mean... I don't act the way you outlined there exactly, but, but I certainly belong to Christ. I know that. I know I'm a Christian. Yeah, I may not live that way, but I know I'm a Christian. Anyway, where does it say all that other stuff? Well, loved ones, let's look at it. It's Romans 8 and verse 9. Old Paul is no fool, you know, and he, he probably often preached to, to people like ourselves. And he's, he's just good, you know, and and the Father can use his words to, to expose things to our eyes. See verse 9 of Romans 8. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, he's saying to the Romans. If the Spirit of God really dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now you see, all Paul is tying it right through from beginning to end. But I think some of you might say, oh, well, that's all right, don't worry about that verse, that's okay. You see, what Paul is saying is, but now, of course, all you people in Rome, you're all not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit, we all know that. You're all Christians. Uh, I mean, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, and of course the Spirit of God obviously does dwell in all of you, now, any of those other poor souls who don't have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to him. And so many of us, you see, kind of interpret it that way. Oh, yeah, Paul's just kind of reassuring them. It's all the boys getting together and building each other up and saying, yeah, well, we're okay. Those other poor souls that don't have the Spirit of Christ like we do, well, they don't belong to him, but we're all right. Well, loved ones, that would be possible except for one miserable little word that God has ensured is in this sentence. And that's the word, really. And you see, you can't misinterpret the verse that other way when that word, really, is there. Because what Paul is doing, he's putting it positively. He's saying, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. And then he points out, that is, if the spirit of God really dwells in you, And so he's really saying, yeah, now, you all here are not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit. That is, if the Spirit of God really dwells in you, then you're in the Spirit. Now, if the Spirit of God really doesn't dwell in you, then you're not in the Spirit. And then he says, now, don't start making subtle distinctions about the difference between having the Spirit and dwelling in the Spirit. Let's face it, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So he's really saying, look, you can't be half a Christian. You can't be in the spirit and in the flesh. You're either in one or the other. So don't start making all kinds of complicated distinctions that enables you to live on drugs and tranquilizers and alcohol every day of your life, enables you to manipulate and pressure until you become an absolute nag to your roommate, and then start saying, oh, but you belong to Christ. He says, no. Look, if the Spirit of God really dwells in you, then you will not live this way. You'll live that way. Well, other ones, you may sit there and say, well, I mean, is, is there no out for me? Is, 
is there no possibility? Because what you're saying is maybe half of us here think we're Christians aren't Christians. Well, loved ones, I think there are two possibilities. And here is one of them. It is possible that the Spirit of God really does dwell in you. But that you've never seen it this way before. That's possible. I think a a brother or sister here this morning could really have the Spirit of Jesus living in them, but they just have never seen before so clearly that using tranquilizers or pet pills or using the old movie or the old TV to get their depression out of their hearts, that that is living in the flesh. So it may be new light to you. In which case, you know, you're in the position of 1 John 1 and 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So it seems to me there could be many of us here this morning who have the spirit of Jesus dwelling in us, but we've never seen that those things are living in the flesh, and so now we see it, we rise to it. We could be in that position. could be in the position where you've never seen before that leaning on the roommate and trying to manipulate them into the kind of character that you want them to be is actually living in the flesh. So it could be a question of light. If it's a question of light, then obviously you are a Christian and you'll just walk into the light. Now some of you may say that, yeah, but how do you tell that that's the issue with me? How do you tell that I have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in me But this is just new light to me. Well, if it's just new light, your whole spirit will rise to it, you know. Your whole spirit, the spirit of Jesus inside you, will rise to even those illustrations that we took. And you'll say, yeah, that's the way I'm going to go. I'm not going to manipulate this wife or this husband anymore. I'm not going to lean on this roommate anymore to try to make him the kind of character I want him to be. No, Lord Jesus, I'm going to live that way. Or your spirit would rise to the whole business of depression and he would say, yeah, I see that, Lord. I see I've been stealing from you an opportunity to lift me out of depression by looking to the tranquilizer and the pet pill and the TV and the movie or going out to eat. I see that, Lord Jesus. I've been living in a way that stole from you an opportunity for you to make yourself known to me. Lord, I... From now on, no more. That's it. Likewise with the job. You could say, Lord Jesus, I've never seen my job that way before. But I see you could use this job or you could use any job to give me what I need. It's not my job that earns this money for me. I'm not a self-made man or a self-made woman. This is just your way. I'm doing the job because you told us all to do jobs, to earn our bread by the sweat of our brow. But it's you that gives us our bread. So, Lord Jesus, from now on, I'm going to take that attitude. So, loved ones, if you find your spirit rising like that to this and saying, yeah, that's the way I'm going to go, then the Spirit of Christ really dwells in you and this is just new light. Now, what if the Spirit inside you says, yeah, well, it sounds a nice way to live and yeah, it would be good if everybody lived that way, but I don't think I could live that way and I don't think I want to live that way. I don't want to lose any opportunity to manipulate that wife or husband of mine. No, I depend on that to establish my own value to them. Once I stop doing that, they might be able to do without me. No, no, I'm going to hold to that. And yeah, I see the business about the pet pill and the tranquilizer and the movie and the TV and eating more or going out for a meal to make myself feel better. But... Yeah, that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm sure there's a better way, and I'm sure that other way that he described is good. But at me, I'm going to go on this way. This is the way I'm used to. This is the way any half-decent, sensible, red-blooded American does it. I'm going to do it this way. Now, loved ones, do you see? If that's the response of your spirit, then it's possible that you don't belong to Jesus. See? If there's an antagonism inside you, to living in the Spirit and to the kind of attitudes that result from living in the Spirit, it is possible that you need to deal more deeply with Jesus in some way. So it's good just to face it, you know. Just good to see. Now, there are two possibilities. I'll only be able to deal with one today. But there are two possibilities. One is that you're just a natural man or a natural woman. 
Now, not natural in this good sense of natural, but you're not born of God. That the Spirit of Jesus has not come into you. That's why you find that you admire those things, but you really inside have an antagonism towards living that way yourself. It could be that the Spirit of Jesus has never been sent into your spirit. It could be that you're just a plain, unspiritual, non-Christian, natural man or woman. Now, it's really important to see that if that's the case. Really. Now, you may say, oh, that's stupid. I've come here for four years. I enjoy coming here. I enjoy most of your sermons. I agree with most of what you say. That's, I like it. I like the spirit of love and peace that there is in the auditorium. I really enjoy this. That's stupid, you saying I'm not a Christian. I like this. I really do. Now, loved ones, do you see that... The natural man can believe that God exists, can believe that Jesus has died for everybody in the world, and can believe that God's way is the best way to go. He can believe all that, and yet still remain a natural man. Remember in James it says, even the demons believe and shudder. It is possible, do to come to a place like this And to simply believe, really, it's nice coming here together every Sunday. It's just good. It has a healthy effect on my emotional health each each week. It's just a good uplift. A natural man or a natural woman could remain a natural man or a natural woman and still believe many of the things that we talk about and could just enjoy coming. It is possible to believe all those things and still be a natural man or natural woman. The only way you know you're not a spiritual man or spiritual woman is when these things are described, though you admire them and think they would be good for everybody else, yet you yourself are not prepared to change your life, to come into that kind of life yourself. A natural man or a natural woman really has, in fact, a kind of security. And I think often we feel, oh, well, no, I mean, they, they, they couldn't. But really, a a person who isn't born of the Spirit often has a security because they don't really know themselves. They don't really know themselves. When they hear of the kind of surrender that is needed to enter into the life of the Spirit, they say, manana, manana. Yeah, I'm going, boy, I'm going to make that decision someday. Yeah, I am. I'm going to change for the moment. I'm going to depend on the rainbow, on the Lincoln Dell. I'm going to depend on uh, all in the family. I'm going to depend on Godfather too for my lifts. But there will come a day when I'm going to make the change. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. And they get great security from the fact that they think that they can change. They think it's just a matter of deciding and their will will change. They don't see that subtly, deep down, the will of Satan is getting its way in their life because they keep on saying, manana, tomorrow I'll change. Tomorrow. Or in a few years I'll change. Or later on I'll make the decision and I'll bring this into my practical life. They get security from the fact that they don't know how subtle and how deceptive their own will is. I've kept from quoting this boy for a long time, but... He was good in the 18th century. And he was in Oxford and knew the way we subtle, so-called educated sophisticates think. He says this, But this ignorance never so strongly glares as in those who are termed men, and probably women's lib wasn't in, so men or women of learning. If a natural man be one of these, he can talk at large of his rational faculties of the freedom of his will and the absolute necessity of such freedom in order to constitute a man a moral agent. He reads and argues and proves to a demonstration that every man may do as he will, may dispose his own heart to evil or good as it seems best in his own eyes. And so often, you see, we think, and someday we'll do it. Someday we will change. Now, loved ones, really, it's a sleep that the natural man or woman is in. It's a sleep. They really are not aware 
of how dangerous their position is. Because the longer they keep on living that way, the more difficult it becomes for them to realize you have to actually change your life to get into this kind of life. You have to change. It's no use listening to all this stuff Sunday after Sunday. It's no use agreeing with it all. You actually have to apply it to your life on Monday morning. You have to do something. Many of us think, oh yeah, but if I were a natural man, I wouldn't have any joy. Loved ones, of course you would have joy. The world is filled outside with people of all kinds of joy and happiness. All right, maybe not the real deep joy that Jesus can bring, but the natural man can have a lot of joy. Real satisfaction, you know, if he's an artist, can have a real sense of fulfillment in his art. Uh, If uh, uh, the woman uh, is someone who enjoys baking, can have a real sense of satisfaction in baking. If uh, you're a carpenter, can have a real sense of fulfilling your faculties and your abilities in doing carpentry. There is a, a great deal of joy that can be had outside Jesus. So the natural man can often have a great happiness and a joy that looks like real joy. Just the joy of living in the beautiful world we have, of going out in a sunny morning and feeling the sun in your face. There's plenty of happiness, happiness from things that happen. That always comes into trouble when the things don't happen right. But there is a joy that the natural man can have. I think often, you know, some of us say, yeah, but... Really, he hasn't the freedom that we have, but often he does. Often he thinks he walks in great liberty. Often he thinks, oh, I'm glad I'm not tied as a slave to that person, Jesus, the way all those other poor narrow-minded creatures are. I'm glad I haven't the bigotry and the superstitions that they have. I'm glad I'm a liberal, educated man who can think in all kinds of situations. I can see everybody's point of view. I can understand everybody's viewpoint on things and insight. And I can get the benefit of them all. And a natural man often imagines himself to walk in greater liberty than anybody else. The loved ones, do you see, you can go very far in happiness and so-called peace and still be a natural man or a natural woman. Of course, the mark of a natural man or a natural woman is they walk in the flesh day after day after day. They bounce from the tranquilizer to the aspirin to the movie to the TV to a new car to a vacation to a new book to read to give themselves a kind of lift. They live in the flesh day after day. Indeed, they commit sin more or less continuously day by day without any worry or any sense of conviction about it. And that's how you tell they're a natural man or natural woman, by the way they live day by day. Now, loved ones, that could be your situation. There is another possibility that I'd like to try to discuss next day of a a person under the law instead of under the Spirit. And they would have some of these marks. But say you find yourself in that position today. Say Jesus has spoken to your heart at this moment and has said, you know, that's right. You've been coming here for years. But actually, you haven't changed in your life. Some little things have changed. You've become a little mellower in some things. But you haven't really started to live fully in the Spirit. Well, loved ones, if that's your situation, be practical, plain, and commonsensical the way you are in the rest of your life. Just be plain and commonsensical about it. Just admit it. Just say to whoever you understand God to be, just say, God, I don't have your spirit within me. I admire those things. I admire the way he describes we should tackle life, but I myself don't want to do it that way. Father, I admit your spirit is not within me. Lord Jesus, I admit your spirit is not within me. There's a different spirit rises in me, an antagonistic spirit to those things. Now, Father, I admit it. And then, loved ones, ask Jesus what changes he would make in your life if he were going to come into it. That's it. It's just down-to-earth practical stuff. Just admit it first, and then ask him, Lord, what changes would you make in my life if you had the running of it completely in your hands. And then, dear ones, whatever he says, 
then submit to him on those things. Then just say to him, Lord Jesus, I don't see the sense of it, frankly, but I believe you. I believe you're the beginning and the end of all things. I believe your infinite wisdom. I believe that you know best for me. So I don't understand it, but I submit on these points, Lord. And I'm willing for you to run it that way. And then, loved ones, the moment you have submitted, that same moment God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your heart. Because God doesn't need you to wave to him and say, I submit it. The Holy Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit of truth. And he can see the machinations and the workings of your mind and your spirit. And the second you are willing to submit on everything that he has pointed out to you needs to be changed, that same second he sends the Spirit of his Son into your heart. Then you can exercise faith that you have received the Spirit of Jesus. And that's what you need to do. Because faith, of course, is an absolute confidence that God has already done what he said he would do. And God has sent, he will send the spirit of his son into any heart that submits to him and obeys him. And then all you need to do is trust and obey that dear spirit of Jesus day by day. And nourish the spirit of Jesus within you by praying and by reading the Bible. So, loved ones, could you, could you decide in your own mind, you know, where you stand? See it. I think there's a great danger of us all assuming, oh, we're all Christians here. See, that's, that's what's so, so dangerous. Now, those of you who are Christians, don't get all shook and say, oh, I'm not a Christian. But those of us who have any uncertainty about it, act now, today, you know. And do those things, just admit it. Lord Jesus, I don't have your spirit. Your spirit does not seem to rise to these things. I admire them, but I don't want them for myself. Lord Jesus, I admit your spirit is not within me. Now, what would you change in my life if you were to come into me? And then if you submit on those things, don't. if you say, Lord, I'm willing to change that way, then God sends the spirit of his son in. But I think it's important maybe, you know, to, to see the implications of Romans 8 and 9 there. And to stop this bluff where we say, well, we don't, we're Christians, but we don't live like Christians. Because no. it's really difficult, if I have a broad southern accent, it's really difficult for me to persuade you that I was born in Ireland. Because <laughs> you say, look, let's face it, Irishmen talk like Irishmen. Well, God says that. My children live like my children. You know it. Loved ones, will you, if we have a time of just quietness, would you, would you deal with God if you need to about it? You know, uh, don't, don't put it off, you know. Don't say, oh, well, I'm not there, but, well, it has to be some other way. Maybe I'll wait for the Bill Gothard seminar. No. <laughs> it's just a variation on manana, you know. It's just manana. Shall we pray? Dear Father, we would come to you as a family who love each other. And Father, we tell you that we want no part of hypocrisy or pretending. And Lord, we don't want to start dividing up your word so that somehow we can feel comfortable with it. Lord, we take that word to our hearts that comes to us. Where Paul says, but you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. If the spirit of God really dwells in you. And Lord, if you see us not living in the Spirit, but living in the flesh, then will you show us whether the Spirit of God really dwells in us or not? And Lord Jesus, if our hearts do not rise and want to enter into all these things, then Lord Jesus, we'd admit now that your Spirit doesn't dwell in us. We have accepted the ideology of Christians We've accepted the ways and the habits of Christians. But we do not have the spirit of a Christian living in us. Now, Lord Jesus, what would you change in my life if you had the running of it completely in your hands? Lord Jesus, I know that you will enter me immediately, I submit on these things. 
Now, Lord, if you see a readiness in me to live the way you're showing me that you want me to live, then I know that you've already come into my heart. And indeed, it's you within me that is signifying a readiness to live according to your guidance and your rules and your laws. And so, Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming in. Thank you, Father, for sending the Spirit of Jesus into my heart. Lord Jesus, I intend now to listen to you and to let you grow in me by praying to you each day and by studying your word until you have taken over all of me completely. And use me for your glory.